Okay, great. Uh, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving up your very precious time, especially now uh, in the evening, to listen to this talk on innovation in ENT. Um, though I've, I've got to be honest, um, not everything I'm going to talk about today is within the field of ENT, but hopefully it will be interesting nonetheless. Um, you know, just as I love being an ENT surgeon, it's for the very reason that our specialty, I think, lends itself to innovation. And it's no secret that us as ENT surgeons, we generally embrace technology. Um, we're all innovators at heart, and I think that's why we've all gone into this specialty. Um, and that's why there's loads of innovation examples within ENT. You just have to Google it. You'll come up with all sorts of ideas on new devices or research findings, surgical techniques all with that one goal of pushing our specialty forward. So uh, Ashan gave me this task of talking to you today about my personal experience and journey through um, innovation. And the reason that I like to do these talks is because it's the best way for me to learn. And my personal innovation story is, is a far from conventional one. Uh, and I rarely take the time to sit back and reflect and try and qualify everything that's happened um, to us um, in the last few years that, that makes colleagues or even yourselves think I'm even worthy of sitting before you today virtually to talk about um, innovation in ENT. So what my plan was to take you through a journey, um, our journey, try and parallel that with some concepts of innovation. Um, I'm sure most of you have come across this concept of thinking out the box. Uh, and I think a lot, for a lot of people, that they think this is the fabric of innovation. Um, just to be clear, there's nothing wrong with thinking in the box. I'm a big fan of thinking in the box. It's safe, it's sensible, I think it works. Um, but actually for me, true innovation is the person who put the box there in the first place. And I think there are many new ideas that are perceived as being innovative, but they're in fact just a play or a modification on what's already been done. Um, so they are out-of-the-box thinkers, and there's nothing wrong with being an out-of-the-box thinker as well. But the, the true person who inspires, I think, is that risk-taker, the, the square peg in a round hole, the, the person who builds this new box. And when you look into it, there's really two ways in which you can create that new box. One is this flash of genius, just a flash of inspiration. And during COVID-19, I think we've come across loads of examples of, of really great examples of, of innovation uh, within ENT that will help us manage during this very challenging time. But the other method of creating this new box is just out and out hard work with a conscious and a purposeful process to search for innovations and opportunities. And, and the people behind either of these two things, they are the innovators, the entrepreneurs who are focused on creating a change that, that results in some kind of economic or social potential. If you look at that first method, the flash of genius, uh, look, it's a, it's a very cheap way to innovate because you just have to come up with a great idea. Um, the problem is though, it rarely comes to fruition. So you have a fantastic idea. It's hard to push that through. The second method though, with hard work and having a process in place is much more successful. And it's successful because it depends on expertise. And the problem is expertise costs money. And that's why a lot of innovators fail at the first hurdle, because actually their flash of ideas, their genius doesn't last long. And when it comes to creating that process, they often don't have the money in place to see their ideas through. So, you know, if you're lucky enough to work in a, an institution that has these processes or expertise in place, and it's actually quite fun and quite easy to innovate. And I'm very lucky um, to work at Keel Medical School. It is a very inspiring environment. It's surrounded by academics and people who have got this desire to learn and to develop. And it has state-of-the-art facilities where we run a lot of our West Midlands surgical courses, as well as put together some anatomical studies as well. And this is really just a, an example of how you can innovate within these institutions. So, uh, we're really lucky to have intercalating medical students who are doing their master's dissertations, looking at new ways of improving surgical techniques. Uh, we'll, uh, this is one of our students who looked at, for example, the positioning of the uh, spinal accessory nerve in level two and 
uh, looked at its exact orientation with regards to the SCM branch of the occipital artery and the tendon of sternomastoid, measured all of this to try and give a really clear description of how trainees will find that nerve when performing a selective neck dissection. And likewise here, another fourth year medical student who really took apart the whole concept of transoral anatomy, studied it right from the beginning, building it up from scratch, looking at all the different ways in which we could explore transoral anatomy, looked at the finer branches of the uh, facial artery and the lingual artery and how you would approach those transorally. But then what we were lucky enough to have at Kiel is this partnership with really big companies and institutions and Primal is one of those companies that we have a license agreement with. So we take some of this data that we found from our research studies and we can actually put that into some of Primal's excellent 3D animations that they have that helps to develop that learning and put it out there for everyone to see. And then likewise, we've been working on a combination idea of getting high definition 4K video footage from surgery, overlaying that with some of these animations and creating really new state of the art videos to, to break down the steps of surgery and try and make it easy for people to understand, you know, how do we do a selective neck dissection? Because often when you're following textbooks, it can be quite difficult to understand. When we were doing the transoral dissections, there was a huge challenge here because we're, we're limited with resources in, in the lab, but we used an endoscope and the endoscope gave us a fantastic view inside the oral cavity. But one of the problems was instrumentation. We were able to transfer the techniques of endoscopic surgery transorally, that was quite easy to do. And we used things like these, these pneumatic uh, arms um, that were really good at just positioning inside the mouth and would give you a fantastic view inside the oral cavity. But the real challenge was finding the right instruments to use to manipulate and maneuver around the very awkward base of tongue in particular. So you'll see on the screen on the left hand, I basically just got a pair of tonsil forceps which have the reach but don't necessarily have the right angulation or grip. So we were able to go back into the lab at Kiel and look at a whole host of different ways in which and we could do the dissection instruments that we needed, the kind of angles that were needed, the sort of teeth on the forceps that were required to do these cadaveric dissections. And these dissections, we went all the way from the parapharyngeal space, right up into the neck, right down to the superior thyroid artery, um, you know, really extensive dissections transorally. And again, because we're in this institution, we were able to partner up with some um, good, strong medical companies who are interested in instrument development. And you can see on the right here, uh, some forceps that started off as 3D prototypes and printing, and then gradually we started printing them in, um, in steel. And eventually we developed something called the, the Keel mucosectomy forceps. Really simple, they just cost a few quid. Um, but what they allow us to do is all of those issues we had before with the reach and the angulation and the view, um, just for a few quid, we've got a really simple instrument that's just a single use instrument that you can take out and quite easily with a, a standard 30 degree endoscope perform a transoral mucosectomy just for a few pounds. And it's incredibly effective and we're really excited to see that this is gonna be coming out onto the market very, very soon. So, you know, working at Kiel and within the NHS is inspirational because it has a lot of those facilities in place and it'd be wrong for you not to embrace those opportunities that's presented to us as ENT surgeons. But what about if you're outside the protection of that setup? Is it possible to successfully innovate without the safeguards in place, the governance, the academic and healthcare, finance and institutions that are there? And this is the story really of our company, which is Endoscope I, which I've got to be honest, started with a flash of an idea. So in all honesty, it was destined to fail from the beginning because we had absolutely no idea about what we were doing. And this was way back in 2012. So the flash of the idea came when I was a registrar. And this is in the days where we used to write in notes and you know, my writing wasn't the greatest, but you're documenting findings from looking inside the ear. And this was fraught with a whole load of problems because first of all, you're writing on paper. We wanted to digitalize all of that system. It was illegible. The drawings were a bit um, inaccurate. 
And then the other thing is it's very difficult to share this kind of information. We can all relate to that. And around 2012, um, Apple had just released the iPhone 4S. It was a half decent camera, but actually I had this idea that you could probably align the lenses, but the picture was absolutely awful. So even though the idea was there, this was the best kind of picture that you could obtain at the time. This, this is what it started off as. So this was what our attachment started off as. This is my idea. And if it was left to me, that's probably where our company would have ended up uh, pretty soon. But fortunately, it wasn't left to me because one of the biggest tips I've got when you're innovating is to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. For me, that's not really that difficult. And uh, the, the two guys that I was fortunate enough to know on the left is Chris Colson, who's a, an otologist from Birmingham. On the right is Mark Prince, who's an engineer working at Aston University. And these two very clever guys, basically, when I told them the idea that I had, weren't convinced at all. Um, but I think, in all fairness, because we were friends, they thought, we'll entertain him and we'll just see where it goes. So within about 30 minutes of speaking to Mark, um, he um, made these drawings. So certainly put my absolutely awful sketch to shame. Um, this was pretty exciting for me because suddenly your idea starts to look really good. Um, and then when you get an engineer involved, they start doing something called CAD, which are computer assisted drawings. Your idea suddenly looks like something that then is 3D printed. And this is what we had. We had the concept for the very first time. Uh, the picture though was still awful. And it was fraught with a lot of issues when you're 3D printing uh, certainly at the time, the materials that you print with are quite weak and brittle. So even though it looks the business, you're using um, quite poor materials and also using software that's just really meant for capturing uh, pictures of scenery and people are not meant to be looking down an endoscope. So the honest truth is that it was terrible. Um, so um, we realized that we needed to, if we were going to make this work, we needed more expertise and um, I met um, our um, technical director, Simon, um, in the Swan in Harbon, which is basically in the pub. And um, I, I didn't have any idea at the time whether he was going to be any good at software, but we didn't really have a choice and I had no money. So I just offered him 25% of our company, which at the time was worth nothing. Um, uh, foolishly uh, he accepted that challenge and he then took the image on the left which is the image that we were getting and uh, when you get experts involved uh, it is absolutely amazing what they could do so suddenly we started to be able to capture uh, a half decent picture down an endoscope and then we had the really difficult task of trying to sell this idea to um, people that we wanted to listen. So we took it to the RSM back in 2012 and, and it got some recognition. Uh, we submitted it for a Cutler's Prize, but um, the Royal College rejected it saying that they didn't think that mobile devices had a place in healthcare because of um, issues with security. So this was back in 2012. So it was all a bit deflating, to be honest, because we thought we had something pretty special, but. Um, we weren't really getting anywhere. And um, we pressed on though. So we realized that we weren't gonna get funded and we were gonna struggle a bit for getting money. So we decided to fund things ourselves. So we delved into our pockets and um, uh, it's amazing how careful you are when you're spending your own money. Uh, we decided to uh, invest in some time in learning about injection molding. So. This is a different process to 3D printing where the materials that you're working with are much more solid, much more predictable, and the finish is much nicer. You can do many more things with injection molding, but we had to learn about all of this. And then suddenly, you know, we had a really nice looking device compared to the printed version, an app that looked pretty solid. And, um, you know, we, we had to invest a bit of money again and some marketing so that it actually looked like we weren't just four guys who were um, trying to have a go and we were trying to make ourselves look a bit more professional. And then we were faced with a lot of questions and reservations because people were saying that, well, if you do this, you're going to have to do one for every iteration of iPhone 
that comes out and it's not going to be cost effective as a business model and it will never really work but maybe foolishly we carried on and we did one for every version of iphone and then um, we had to learn about the MHRA and learn about what it was to uh, register a medical device. Fortunately, both the app and the um, clip were class one devices and all of the process that had to be put in place. But when you put it all together and uh, talk about it and publicize it over the years, more and more, you start learning that your device actually might have somewhere to go. So we created hopefully this new box and we were challenged by it a lot and people weren't convinced about it about using mobile devices in healthcare and I think it's safe to say now that maybe mobile devices are more accepted in healthcare um, you know when you create a new box it is phenomenal that we created this thing for ENT I created it because of the issues with documentation in ENT and all of a sudden we've got vet, vets around the world saying this is great we can start to scope large and small animals and it, it um, gets rid of a whole load of problems that they had with their examinations and then i think when a load of other devices start coming out you think well maybe the idea wasn't so bad so um that was the the, the first thing that we did and it was a, a really interesting journey and a lot of hard work and a lot of failures along the way but i think it turned out pretty good uh, and in the words of, of um, a, a very smart guy, uh, we didn't want to just kind of do one thing. We love that journey so much that we just had to try and think, well, what else can we do? And the obvious thing was, well, you know, telemedicine has always been trying to get off the ground. Could we mash together our product with telemedicine and create a whole new way of ENT problems being managed between primary and secondary care? So the idea that anyone can really endoscope in here, it doesn't have to be a consultant, but the consultant could review that picture and then you could just relay it back to the patient and say, yep, you've got a perforation or no, your um, ear looks absolutely fine or whatever that might be. So um, we spent a lot of time kind of doing a circuit of various talks and uh, innovation expos. And um, after pitching our idea, eventually someone said, well, we've got about 50,000 pounds of money left over in our uh, transformation innovation pot. You, you, can, you can have it and see where you go with it. And that's literally one of the... This came through the West Midlands Academic Health Science Network of trying to put our service into play in Staffordshire and trying to see if we can get GPs to perhaps take images of the ear and send that to us as clinicians uh, we could provide this telescopic service. Uh, we were then faced with the challenges of having to register the whole service with the CQC and being interviewed with the CQC, uh, getting all of the governance put together and there are hundreds of documents as you can imagine and rightly so to set up this new service as well as making sure that all the data that you are collecting is registered with the commissioner's office. So a lot of hard work to do uh, on top of your day-to-day -day job and then in order for this to be successful, we knew that it wasn't just a case of putting the device in the hands of the GPs, but we had to train them. We had to provide the support, the opinion. And then one of the other bigger challenges of giving uh, clinicians these devices is how you deploy them. And what I mean by that is you can't just expect them to take an iPhone and turn it on and put their own um, iTunes account onto it. So we use a process called mobile device management, um, which I'll come on to um, uh, in a second here, which essentially is a cloud-based system whereby you can take control of uh, an iOS device as it comes straight from the factory, and we can deploy all of our apps onto that device and secure the device completely um, so that from the um, person's perspective of opening it at the box fresh they just literally turn it on and it starts to upload all of the apps that it needs to have and sets all the security settings so when we're running the service we have full control of the devices so that if they go missing we can lock them down we can track them replace them etc so this was another brand new mechanism that we had to learn about and of course there's a, a cost um, that goes along with this and a whole load of administration with mobile device management. But it's then quite exciting 
uh, to start seeing GPs using your product for the first time and um, using it not only to send the images, but have that consultation with the patients to explain the problems. And you know, the images that they were getting, this is now 2016 we were doing this, so we're using iPhone 6s or iPods, uh, but the images that we're getting were really, really good and the kind of things that the GPs could do in the practice, like just removing foreign bodies or even picking up really rare pathologies as well. So, you know, seeing the pulsation of a glomus tumour, I don't think many people see it this clearly. So really great from a teaching point of view, as well as the referral side of things. It was our duty then to make sure if we were going to do this properly, that we had to evaluate it and evaluate it in the most honest way. Uh, and that we had published just at the beginning of this year. And I think it's quite a candid and very honest viewpoint of how to deploy a telemedical service to GPs, because it was incredibly challenging to get them up to speed with the technology, to work with um, various Wi-Fi networks and security issues. It definitely wasn't an easy thing to do, but all in all, in terms of reducing referrals into hospital, it definitely worked. So off the back of that, um, Chris and his team at UHB have um, now um, spearheaded an HR funded application to really roll this out mainstream for a large tertiary quaternary teaching center to use this as the mainstay of how they're going to manage all of their um, air care referrals. And that's currently going through now um, with um, the hope that it would reduce patient weights and uh, save a whole load of money to the NHS. So what about in Stoke? So Stoke is where I work and the, the um, advantage of using the device uh, we thought was that it can be put onto any endoscope. So my interest is in the head and neck and what we were interested in doing is setting up a whole new service for screening um, early laryngeal cancer and in particular trying to deal with the two week wait uh, issue that was just spiraling out of control because as well as the otoscopic images these are just iPhone images that come off looking at the larynx and you can really get some nice detailed pictures as well as sound from viewing that down a flexible endoscope. And our system now in Stoke works in two ways. It's either a live capture and a referral. So whilst we're doing the examination, we can capture still images of the examination and then the software within the app allows you to put that directly into a PDF which automatically uploads into our electronic patient record system and goes to the GP. But the new system we've got in place with telescopic referrals is actually a store and forward system. So this is where we have a technician who actually records the endoscopic images and then they will send that to us. So on the left side is the uh, view that the consultant would get. So they get 10 uh, to 15 endoscopic videos uh, with a bit of detailed history to review. It takes a few seconds to review. And again, that detail is PDF and sent off to the uh, patient and to the GP as well. So um, this new process obviously required a complete change in the way in which we were managing two weights in Stoke. It involved a whole load of information sharing agreements, change in data pathway maps. We had to be cyber essentials registered, make sure our GDPR was compliant and again, update the governance toolkit. And the DPIA is a data privacy impact assessment that you have to do for any new um, device like this. So working together with management to come up with a whole new way of managing two week waits, which were really spiraling well out of control. So I think you know that was the challenges that were involved for us in producing a whole new referral mechanism and using mobile devices that way. So it's gonna be really exciting to see their part in the future. But, you know, it is the journey that we absolutely love in this. So we keep going and this story takes us to something a little bit different because back in 2016, again, we were contacted by the UCI, which is the international cycling body because they'd seen a tweet of someone using the endoscope iPhone camera to look inside a bike. And um, believe it or not, there was a problem in cycling relating to something called technical fraud or motor doping. So we were invited, this is Brian Cookson on the right, he was the president of the UCI 
uh, they invited us to Aiglade in Switzerland to show us what people were apparently doing. And it was amazing. So they were uh, putting motors in their bikes to get maybe four to 500 extra watts of power in things like the tour and the Olympics. And that obviously is something that would have absolutely destroyed the sport of cycling, which already is a little bit controversial in terms of uh, doping within the competitors. So um, the challenge there, though, was now we had a process in place in terms of um, how we felt we could solve this problem. They thought it was using the endoscope camera. We felt we had the expertise to solve it in a very different way. And we did that by using an app that could actually create a static magnetic field and detect the magnetic disturbance of a motor within a bike frame. And this meant that you didn't need to take the bike apart and endoscope down it, but actually you can just run an iPad over it in about 20 seconds and it will tell you if there was a motor inside. And so we were a bit skeptical about whether this idea was going to work, to be honest with you, but it seemed to work in some of our tests. And the UCI decided that they would test our tablet out secretly uh, a few months after we developed the prototype and they took it to an under 21 world cycling championship race just to give it a test run and make sure that um, it was okay and what we never expected was to find someone with a motor in their bike and this is currently still the only case of technical fraud ever recorded in the history of cycling this is on our very first test. Unfortunately, this young lady, Femke van den Dreisch, has now been banned from the sport of cycling. She was the under 21 world cyclocross champion at the time, and she's unfortunately been stripped of that title. But um, it was absolutely crazy to think that we've almost developed this concept now of having to screen not just the individual, but also the bikes for technical fraud. Um, you don't have to do large things, I think, when you innovate. It, it can be pretty small scale ideas. Um, you, we relate back to the transoral surgery that uh, I was talking about before. And what we've started to do now, instead of using our conventional optical scopes in order to get a better picture, we've started to use the Storz 3D endoscope. And hopefully you can see um, over here what we have is the scope just passing through this pneumatic arm. One of the challenges that we had though was that this pneumatic arm was made by a different company and we couldn't get an adapter that actually fitted this well. So uh, we worked alongside uh, the guys who made these adapters and took some of the measurements from both the endoscope and the adapter and basically catted it up. We've now got a process by which we can do this. We have a license for SolidWorks, which is the program that we use to create these prototypes um, and 3D printed it up and we could do it. So it was amazing. Suddenly we've got a 3D endoscopic view inside the oral cavity. But what would be really fantastic would be to try and translate 3D for all of our trainees so that they can learn this operation in 3D and not have to be in the theatre. So in learning about 3D, we realized that there's a number of different ways in which you can obtain this image. Now, Storz produced their image in a top bottom way, which is why you've got two pictures that are slightly offset. But this isn't really a commercially uh, and widespread viable option in terms of viewing for uh, the everyday trainee. So with a bit of software manipulation, we were able to create side by side stereoscopic viewing, which is the kind of 3D imaging that you would just get on a 3D YouTube channel. And we realized we could do this with some of our um, primal picture images as well. So we developed a technique of creating stereoscopic anatomy in 3D as well as stereoscopic endoscopic viewing in 3D. And all it takes to view it is a 35 pound headset. You can buy one of these um, on Amazon. You can buy one right now. You just slide your phone in. We just create the side by side image. And amazingly, you can see all of these surgeries and anatomy and procedures in 3D. If you didn't want to spend 35 pounds, you could buy just a Google Cardboard for 15 pounds. But our idea was to bring this uh, concept of 3D imaging into all of our trainees' hands. And expanding that out again, 
Um, why not actually just take it to a head camera level or any kind of surgical camera? So as long as we have these two um, parallax images that are angulated and distanced correctly, we could probably create a really effective way of teaching um, anatomy because that's one of the problems that we have when you're teaching things like skull-based foramina is viewing it in 3D, especially now that everything's on uh, Zoom and, and, and online teaching. This could work so um, you know this is the difference of, of me doing it on the left side with absolutely awful imaging and uh, mark producing um, CADs that we slice up in a program called Cura and um, stick it into a 3D printer and it, this thing costs about eight pence and all it does is align the angulation of the cameras exactly right so we've done all of the testing on this to produce some stereoscopic um, images of the skull that we're starting to use at Kiel Anatomy to build some really nice uh, resources to teach anatomy in 3D. Um, so, you know, kind of moving on most recently, I think the, the concept that we've come up with right now, this is putting together all of our processes in place. And this was the creation of SNAP, which was the, the safe naso endoscopy assisted procedure. And SNAP really was a process. We didn't, this wasn't a, a kind of brainwave. We were actively looking for a way in which we could assist and improve the safety of nasoendoscopy in clinics so that we can try and restore services back to normal. Um, and so we put everything we knew into this product. So essentially it's a one-way valve that you can fit onto any surgical mask you pass an endoscope through. And it just means that when the patient coughs or sneezes, the droplets are caught in the mask. It's just a really simple concept. Simple in the sense that this is how it started for me um, in March as just a really awful sketch. Uh, and uh, this is how it's ended up with a final three, um, injection molded version that's now just been C marks and is currently being sterilized and cleaned and ready to be sent out. And just to talk you through that process, a lot of it is about um, prototyping and testing. The original idea that you have looks nothing like the final concepts at the end, but this process is iterative and everything has to be audited and screened as part of CE marking, not just the adapter, but also the trocars as well that create the um, hole. Um, the valve that we've engineered inside the SNAP had to be cheap enough to manufacture, but had to be small enough in terms of microns uh, to create an effective seal so that when the patient coughed or breathed, the valve would shut. But at the same time, on the other side, has to be able to admit a four millimeter endoscope easily so that it can be passed through the nose. And then we have to take this to a testing level that people would expect for any kind of medical device to industry where we use optical particle counters to measure the efficacy of a snap versus a mask on its own versus using nothing at all, just to show that it does indeed reduce particles right down to 0 0.1 microns within the room. And we've tested snap according to all of the British safety standards, um, uh, uh, taking it down to a company called MET, MET test all of the masks that you all know now as FFP1 and P2 and P3. And we've been no exception with testing the snap on that. All of this, as you can imagine, costs a heck of a lot of money and takes a lot of time. But we've learned over the eight years with our processes that these, is, that these are the things that have to be done in the right way. On the left is just the kind of clinical evaluation of the skills that are required in terms of learning how to scope with this new device. You know, roughly it takes about 30 endoscopies for you to suddenly start getting up to speed with scoping just like we'll do without a mask. And this is just one example of processes that are involved in uh, classifying a class one device. It's a, an FMEA, a failure mode effective analysis. You have to tear apart your device and look at every single which way it could fall apart. Uh, that could be even that it could fall off and the patient could swallow it and all of these things uh, and, and do risk assessments. Uh, in order to, to make sure that you've covered every base of, of the device. So um, we're excited to say that this thing's going to be coming to the market now, but the, the real um, um, uh, thing about the SNAP is that it, it showcases, I think, everything that we've learned in the last 
eight years. Uh, you know, our, our company and the scope I, we, we, we are not about products. Um, you know, we started off as a product and I was incredibly lucky that it, it was a half decent idea and uh, we were surrounded by people who were smart enough to make it work. Um, but we use that to create a, a, an innovation cycle. And it's that innovation cycle, I think, that is our intellectual property, not the products that we make, but you know, these individuals that I have the pleasure of working with in the company who continue to uh, inspire me and, and, and innovate all the time. It is incredibly hard work. Uh, and hopefully you can see that in what uh, I've presented today. But definitely the case is that it's the journey that we enjoy more than the final destination. And that's why we love it. And that's why we'll continue to innovate. That's all I've really got to say in about half an hour. Thank you really so much for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Ajit. That was absolutely brilliant. I loved watching the entire journey that you guys had right from the idea and how, what everything, what, what all things go into the innovation cycle, so to speak. That's brilliant. I think everybody has been pretty much left tongue tied. The, I, the, there's not been any questions in the chat as of yet. Um, before we actually go on, uh, from your point of view, say I have an idea today. What all things do you feel one needs to go through to bring that to fruition? So you have an idea, you want to involve probably a design engineer, someone from a design engineering background, what else? I mean, it's, it's, it's just something that we clinicians, a lot of the time, we don't really think about these things. No, so you've got two options of this. Um, the obvious one is to use your um, uh, R&I department in your trust, because normally most places have the infrastructure in place to help clinicians, and clinicians naturally will have ideas because that's how we're kind of created and they will help you to take your idea through in terms of signing the appropriate non-disclosure agreement so that you're not giving away any of your intellectual property at a very early stage. Because if you truly have a great idea, the really difficult thing is you can't tell anyone about it until you protect it. And that is really quite a tough thing because you don't know if it's going to work unless you speak to someone who's an expert about it. So that's why I think the safe thing to do is to go to your R&I department. But of course, in doing so, you will inevitably share some of that intellectual property with your hospital or with your trust. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because inevitably within your contract, that's actually the agreement that you have that anything that you come up is going to be shared with them. And certainly as consultants, um, every year we have to sign disclosures about all of the projects or companies that we're involved with so that if anything like that in terms of patent agreements comes up then the trust is fully aware of it because technically they can claim some of your ip so if you don't have friends who are incredibly smart that you trust <laughs> I, I, basically that's what what i was lucky enough to have is that i had guys who i could trust who were just very very clever and create the the kind of prototype and product so we did luck out then I think your R&I department in your hospital is, is probably the safest place to go to. But bear in mind that will also be quite painful because you really want to see your idea come to fruition quickly. And we had, I think, the first concept of our um, phone clip um, in hand in about seven days. And that is an amazing thing to think of something and physically see it in seven days. Right now, you know, a 3D printer costs you 500, 500 quid, something like that. You could probably do it. You know, back in 2012, they were a lot more expensive than that. So I think if it's a product, you could probably do it yourself. You go on YouTube, you could probably get onto um, some um, open source software. Um, 3D printing is not too difficult to learn. And that's what I love about the internet now is that you can pick up a lot of these skills and test out things yourself. Well, I know who to make friends with then. Right. 
Uh, we do have a few questions coming in from the uh, from the audience as well. So one of our head neck colleagues, um, he has asked, how and who did you approach to navigate the rules regarding taking pictures of cadaveric studies? Um, so uh, Kiel Anatomy, um, we are um, basically divided into postgraduate surgery and undergraduate surgery. Our postgraduate surgery um, department uh, is run by an IT that is very strict on imaging and we have our own bequeathal program. Uh, the advantage of that means that when our um, donors donate their body, it is written within the consent whether or not we're able to use their imaging as part of uh, teaching and education. And in doing so, it's very clear as to what those images can be used for. So all of the donors consent to it. Um, some of them are used for undergraduate medical teaching and some of them are used for postgraduate surgical teaching, which is demonstrating surgical techniques. So we're very protective at Keel as to how we showcase our cadaveric material and what platforms we will use for that kind of thing. But um, that's how we do it. It's all written into the consent of um, our bequeathal service. Brilliant. Um, and there's another question from the audience. Uh, I'm not very sure what they mean, but they've asked, what about navigation for FES and skull-based surgery? It's a, it's a fairly open-ended question. So I'll let you interpret it as you feel that should be. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we, there's, I wonder if it's talking about anatomy overlay, because um, uh, I'm sure all of you know uh, Vin Valerian, the, the amazing... Um, work that he's done on robotic surgery at the Marsden. And uh, we've had a lot of discussion with Vin about overlaying anatomy as well as imaging onto um, endoscopic surgery uh, pictures. So can you get live image overlay? Because we've managed to do that with the um, images from um, Primal and put that on top of uh, live surgical pictures. Can we do the same? So that's something that we're working on at the minute. And we think in theory it is possible. We're doing it alongside some of our prosthetics departments because these guys really know how to look at um, images, slice them up, to put them into different orientations and um, um, uh, maybe put them into Im imaging that way. But one of the problems that you have is those files that you saw on 3D, you're looking at two stereoscopic full resolution 4K videos. So, you know, those clips are gigabytes in size. And that's one of the challenges of sharing it because if you put it onto Twitter, for example, it will really downplay the resolution and you'll lose all of the benefits there. So, the difficulty at the minute is not necessarily creating the images, but how you share that. Um, when you use these BNX headsets, one of the advantages and the reason why I like that one so much is that it has a little um, opening on the side that you can put one of these um, lightning sticks in. So I don't know if you can see that there, but it's a, a kind of 128 gigabyte stick and you can stick that into your phone and run uh, huge files live off the phone through that. So it is possible to do. That's quite interesting. Um, I mean, taking the, the question of overlaying images a, a step further, um, what's your thoughts on augmented reality? And do you see that having some uh, some practical utility in the coming future? Yeah, I mean, we, we've looked uh, at Kiel at VR, uh, virtual reality, which is a very kind of singular experience. Uh, augmented reality, which perhaps can be shared a bit more because you can visually see everyone else in, in, in the room. And then the HoloLens, uh, certainly HoloLens 2, which is using a mixed reality environment, which is putting VR and AR together. And I think um, that was the uh, idea of maybe bringing some of the VR experience into a wider classroom. It, it's all exciting technology visually. The challenge that we have is whether it's actually going to enhance your learning. Um, personally, I think um, augmented reality used in the right way is really good for learning, but it's really hard. So say, for example, in the anatomy environment, if I get someone to put some goggles on, it's really hard for me to talk through 
what they're looking at because every time they move their head, it moves into a different environment. And then if you try and uh, take control of that, I don't know if you've ever done it, but if you wear a headset and someone else is controlling the augmented reality, it makes you incredibly sick because they're moving in a way that your body is not accustomed to moving. So I think they look very exciting methods of, of teaching and it makes it onto all the videos, isn't it? It looks very flashy, but at the minute we're struggling to see where the true learning opportunity is. I think 3D and 3D video has definitely got something if we can make it mainstream and make it available to everyone. Uh, and, and that's what our focus is on for now. But we'll keep experimenting with AR and VR and, and, and MR. But I think other than looking fancy, I, I really struggle to see where it's truly useful. I think it's been an amazingly intellectually stimulating talk and it, it's quite inspiring the the journey that you've had with Endoscope Eye as well as all the innovations that you've been doing. So uh, thanks so much for being here, Ajit. No worries. Anyone can do it. Um, it's hard work, but I think that's the, the, the key thing is that if you're into that whole cycle and the journey of creation and you just love to create something then yeah just get out there and do it brilliant i think um, everybody else is still quite spellbound so we can end the talk today thank you so much for coming and um hope to see you around sometime soon all right thanks everyone see you later thank you